as I was walking through the gate, I felt alive, I felt awake. Silent screams fill the air, and the walking dead were there. I could see them dying, lying everywhere. The sky was heavy, the sky was gray. The air was dense on that solemn day. I could smell fear, I could smell sorrow. They all had today, but no tomorrow. As I was walking through the gate. I saw families, I saw rabbis and teachers and writers. A child from Krakow, a Zeta from Gdansk. An unbroken fighter, a world of angst. A father, a mother, a sister, a brother, twins and orphans. I saw dignity broken. I heard prayers unspoken. I saw you and me as I walk through the gate. Four years after the camp's liberation, when we walked through the gate, under the gate, and into Auschwitz. The misery was there if you looked, the screams were there if you listened. The blood and filth in the street, on the walls, and in the barracks were visible. Dead Auschwitz was alive with sadness, shame, and sorrow. Imagine, if you will, writing your name on a suitcase, thinking you would retrieve it at some point down the line. Imagine, if you will, being hungry, always hungry, and never being able to sleep, although you were exhausted and weak. Imagine, if you will, suffocating in a train car, dead bodies under your feet. When you depart the boxcar, you feel whips 
You hear dogs barking and biting, Nazis screaming obscenities, spitting at you. Imagine, if you will, being dragged by a thug into a line with hundreds of petrified, crying women and children. Imagine a concentration camp with dead and dying, anywhere, everywhere. Then imagine, if you will, walking down the stairs with an unending line of Jews into the abyss. The Birkenauer gas chamber, scared, heart racing, lost, alone, powerless, like a sheep at the abattoir. This was a day in the life of a Jew in Auschwitz. Imagine, if you will. There is no parallel to Auschwitz in my life. The camp has been on my radar. Since a young lad, then at the ripe age of 68 in April 2019, I find myself finally walking through the gate and into a concentration slager, Auschwitz. My visit had never felt like a whim or a dream. To me, it was always an inevitability. Why does this gruesome, dark, disturbing place, which tugs me into the heart of darkness, feel like a deja vu. I can't recall a time when Auschwitz did not feature as an appendage to my soul, even before I could spell its name or point to it on a map. It was relevant to my life. It was an important stop I had to make, a piece of the puzzle that required completion in this lifetime. The idea to create The Gate, the musical, arrived a full year after I had walked through the gate. Now, our family flew from Vienna to Krakow. We arrived at John Paul II International Airport in Krakow at 10 at night. Then we took a 40-minute drive through the city to a small Polish boutique hotel. The alarm rang at 4 a.m. We showered, feeling apprehensive, tense, tired, our nerves on edge. We were mostly silent. In the hotel lobby at 5.45 a.m., a sandwich, apple, and a small bottle of juice awaited, invitingly. Packed inside a brown bag like a school lunch when you're a kid, one bag for each person. <laughs> no, there were no names on the bags. And then we depart for the camp in a small black van. It is 6 a.m. Lori, my wife, was hesitant, unsure if she wanted to go. Then, a last minute, yes. My daughter and her husband, McCartney and Graham, are punctual as always and ready for the adventure. My daughter is the ultimate planner. She had booked the entire trip to Europe. We just showed up. Truly kind of her. Thank you, McCartney. Everything ran smooth like a Swiss watch. The drive from Krakow to Auschwitz took an hour. We drove parallel to the train tracks that run from Krakow to the camp. I'm not sure if these are the same train tracks, but I thought that they were the same train tracks, the ones used by Jews earlier in time. A disturbing and horrible connection. Reality is creeping in. I can see Auschwitz. We're getting close. I'm a man who wears a yellow star. Like so many, I wear a yellow star. Through fear, I wear a yellow star. That's who we are. We're the Jews. Children are so weak they don't cry. And last night another Zeta died. He couldn't face the prospects of the cattle car trade and the rabid dogs and madness on the platform. Guards with whips who administer pain to the Jews who wear.
yellow star We are the teachers who wear the yellow star We are the children who wear the yellow star That's who we are The Jews who wear the yellow star In September 1941, the Reich mandated by decree that it was essential to illustrate and to indicate who were the Jews in the population. To this end, they ordered that all Warsaw Jews older than six, older than six, must wear the yellow star of David with the word Judah inscribed on it separating and isolating the population. It had a second benefit to the Reich. The local population could ostracize and separate from the Jews too. It's the perfect Nazi group identifier. Another disgusting, degrading tool that was used in this bizarre Nazi world was given to the survivors of the brutal cattle car train transport that were not sent to the gas chamber but were violently herded onto the Auschwitz platform to be sent to the camp to begin work. The selection process, door number one, if you have any energy and strength left and you are dragged to the labor camp, or door number two, uh, you'll be taken from the platform to the belly of the beast, the waiting gas chamber. Sometimes you will march there Sometimes you were taken in trucks, depending on weather, depending how drunk the guards were, depending on what the guards wanted to do. Sometimes there was no selection. They were too lazy, too tired, too drunk, too sick. So everybody, everybody, everybody went to the chamber. Those not selected to die were gifted with an arm tattoo, each given an individual number, and they were no longer human. They were no longer a name. They were now a number. The inmate personal identifier. Identifying and isolating Jews was a crucial step in Hitler's final solution. They thought long and hard how to make this extermination smooth for them. The ruthless Aryan narcissist thought they were superior to all. How ridiculous, how dangerous, how fucked up. Such thinking plagues us to this very day. Shoes. 
those fucking Nazis. Terrible tyrants, pillagers and plunderers, disgusting scum, continual murderers, swastika boys, ruthless and cruel. The fucking Führer is the fucking crown jewel of the fucking Nazis. The Germanic soldier has blood on his boot. He hits women and children, they are Satan's substitute. They line up in queues to deliver abuse. A Jew fighting against a few. Fucking Nazis. They took my mother. They killed my father. My brother hid, but I don't know where. We wear a yellow star. I walk in the gutter. Cause the fucking Nazis say, Jew boy, you walk there. Jew boy, you walk in the gutter. Fucking Nazis, certifiable maniacs Fucking Nazis, your time will come Fucking Nazis, your day will come Fucking Nazis Disgusting scum Violent coward Take a moment to uh, think Kingston Penitentiary in Canada Take a moment, think Camp 22 A hellhole in North Korea Think San Quentin State Prison, California. All three scary places, uh, hell on earth, he thinks. Now visualize the ultimate worst, the insane, the demonized inmate who roams the yard. The psychopathic thug who terrorizes and controls. The man who defines the word ugly. He spits as he talks. His eyes dark, cold, deadly. I propose that a fitting description of that animal would be he is a fucking Nazi. Let us not misspeak. Fucking Nazis were female too. Talk, walk and run. Lay down, sit up, stand Talk, walk and run Tons of time, stay alive Do everything you're told to do Slow, fast and stop Slow, fast and stop Sorrow, sadness, shame Slow, fast and stop Empty bowls, frozen souls Do everything you're told to do Do everything you're told to do Do everything you're told to do. 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 Do everything you're told to do.
do everything you're told to do. Do everything you're told to do. Do everything you're told to do. Do everything you're told to do. Do everything you're told to do. There's a parking lot, hundreds of cars, tour buses, bicycles, pedestrians mill around. The tour begins at 7.30 a.m. sharp, no dawdling. Your feet do not really stop for the next four hours. It's as if we were on a moving conveyor belt. Building to building, walking, listening, looking, thinking, feeling, imagining, dreaming. Time does not go slow. Time does not go fast. Time stands still. The driver introduces us to Bart, our guide. He's 33 years of age and he's been guiding his guests for over two years in this camp. Before that, he had two years of training, one year of broader Auschwitz history, and one year of facts and figures and tales to use on the tour with the guests. The Auschwitz Museum holds strict standards for their professional guides. Few qualify. Eight hours a day they spend inside the barbed wire fence. Every day, Bart passed through the gate in and out every day that he worked. I wondered how is that possible? How does his mind absorb the energy in here so deeply? This is no ordinary place. Bart was dark. Bart was serious, Bart was kind, Bart was brilliant. Bart chose to spend his days working in the camp to spread awareness of what happened at Auschwitz because he too was motivated, like me, to spread the idea of never again. His grandparents perished there. He gave us the details. I guess there is the answer to the question I pondered. Why would someone work as a guide in Auschwitz work an hour? Bart explained the rules slowly, clearly, with his Polish accent and his extremely competent ESL. We had booked a private family tour. He provided each of us with a headset. He asked us to stay close together and to keep moving. As we walked through the gate, our Biet Mach Frey, which of course means work sets you free, the big lie. The overwhelming feeling I had, I remember, was, I am here. This is really happening. Auschwitz is a holy shrine, a sacred piece of turf, a piece of the planet where hideous, unimaginable mistreatment occurred. My sisters and brothers were dragged here to their deaths. The misery was there if you looked. The screams were there if you listened. The blood and filth were on the streets, in the air, on the walls, in the cracks, in the gutters, in the barracks. Building after building, each had a detailed script. Hair behind glass, spectacles galore, suitcases, lots of them. Brushes, combs, hundreds of mugshots of prisoners staring at me. Children frozen in fear as the Nazi camera clicked, clicked, clicked. One stop was Block 11, which was used by the Nazis for execution and torture. A special building. We got details of that building, too. Between Block 10 and Block 11 stands the Death Wall, where thousands of prisoners were lined up for execution by firing squad. Arriving at the Death Wall, I took my only linger. I touched the wall, hand flushed, pushing deep into the brick. I stood silently in the middle and thought about the moment when thousands of Jews had stood in the same place knowing a bullet was coming that would hurt. They would never see their family again. The Nazi aims. The Nazi shoots. Next. 
It was minute after minute of history, like a dense food which had flavor and character. Auschwitz was all real, no filler, no space between the lines, just one long speech. The dead suffering and starving, invisible, yet always in sight. Bart's voice, a continuous foundation of knowledge, providing intimate, accurate details about life in Auschwitz, about the guards, the capos, the Gestapo, SS, about the weather, the lack of food, the children. He explained how the SS used domination and terror to control the camp's large populations with just a few SS functionaries. The Germans had a system of prison guards, capos, Ukrainian soldiers, the Sonderkommando, all with key instruments in domination. The stories shared that day turned the stomach, hurt the heart. Finally, we arrived at the end of the first leg, onto Birkenhauer. Between Auschwitz and Birkenhauer, we had a 30-minute reprieve. We needed it. The four of us climbed aboard the van to escape the wind and the cold, opened our brown bags and began to eat the sandwich and the fruit and the juice box that was given by the hotel. How could we eat? Well, we did. All of us, I believe, emptied our bags. We didn't talk much, except to ask how we all were. And we were all the same. The drive uh, took uh, a few minutes, and we were in Birkenhauer. Birkenhauer was uh, bigger perhaps more overwhelming in one way, but lack of detail made it a little easier. Eventually we arrived at the Juden Rampa, where the Jews disembarked from the trains and where they were selected to either work or be gassed. It was horrendous standing in that spot, knowing that hundreds of thousands of Jews had stood at that same spot, waiting for some Nazi, to decide. Alongside it stood an original, not restored, cattle car, identical to the way it would have been in 1944. It was small, and Bart explained the cramped and suffocating trip that the prisoners would have experienced, locked inside this car for days. We all know how many died en route. Germans kept track. The tour of Birkenau was extensive and interesting on many, many levels, but I had become numb by now, and it was not an internal numbness, but an external quiet that took over. Overload? I'm not sure. We walked the large camp, Bart sharing facts, feelings, and tales about the prisoner's life, and finally, 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 we arrived at the gas chambers. Folded, fallen, collapsed piles of bricks that were once Birkenauer's crowning jewel, the fucking gas chambers. This is where the Zyklon B was adopted for the mass killings at the camp. Up to 6,000 victims were gassed with Zyklon B each day. Chambers had been destroyed before the Russians arrived to liberate. I, I couldn't understand this. I asked Bart why, why they had waited so long to destroy the incriminating evidence. Why not destroy them weeks earlier and move the rocks and the bricks and the mortar and the evidence around the camp? But no, they didn't. They're just a pile of bricks now. And uh, scientists were able to rebuild them and know what the size of the rooms were and know the procedures. Bart, when asked this question, had a simple answer in his monotonic voice, saying, the Nazis tried to murder as many Jews as possible before fleeing the oncoming liberators. Maniacs ran the asylum, and truth 
is more horrid than fiction. He explained to us that there were usually four SS personnel per gas chamber, led by a non-commissioned officer who oversaw around 100 Jewish prisoners. These prisoners, or Sonderkommando, or Kapos, were forced to assist in the extermination process. Every aspect of the extermination process. Hard to imagine what we will do to live. The actual delivery of the gas to the victims was always handled by the SS themselves. They were accomplished, and they were known as the hygiene division. They would drive the Zyklon B to the crematorium in an ambulance to mitigate fear of the population. And then they would empty the canister into the gas chamber through the holes in the roof, sprinkling down on the waiting Jews. Truth is stranger, more horrid than fiction. We spent two hours in Birkenau, and that too ended. Hug for Bart, he allowed a pitcher and told me that he appreciated our attention, our questions and interest, held my hand for a few seconds, looked me in the eye. We connected his kin, and he was gone. Bard never smiled. Yeah.